Let's take out our Bibles and learn together. If you ask people, what do they need for life? They'll tell you food, water, clothes, money would be nice, and a place to live in. That's what they believe that they need for life. But the problem is, they're thinking only in a physical sense. We need to realize that the scripture says Messiah came, that we might have life, life abundantly. And that term, life abundantly, is connected to the kingdom of God. So what is it that we need for life in the kingdom of God? Well, let me share with you that everyone who will be in the kingdom of God will have something in common. What is that? They will have a covenantal relationship with the living God. Now, the Bible speaks about many covenants. So when I say a covenantal relationship, what am I speaking about? Well, that's exactly what we're going to talk about in today's study. So take out your Bible and look with me, if you would, to the book of Galatians in chapter 4, the book of Galatians chapter 4, where we left off last week in verse 21. And what we find here is that the Apostle Paul is teaching concerning the two primary covenants in the Old Testament, the law of Moses and the covenant that God made with Abraham. And it's very important that we have a right understanding of both so that we can apply them to our life properly and be found justified by grace. So let's begin. We read last week this verse. Let's review. Paul is speaking to the Galatians and he asks them a question. He says, say to me, the ones who want to be under the law. Now, that is an expression that we've talked a great deal about over the last few weeks, this, this phrase to be under the law, to be under its authority. That is to apply the law to our lives. Now, there were those, and we talked about that, that believed that through the law, and when they spoke of the law, they were speaking primarily of the commandments, what we call mitzvot. The, the deeds that the Torah tells us to do and not do. But Paul's going to say something in a moment. He says, those of you who want to be under the law, he says, tell me, do you not hear what the law says? Now, what he wants to reveal to them is this. When we look at the Torah, we just don't see commandments. There's also revelation. There's information. And there, even according to the Torah, we learn that the entrance into the kingdom of God is not by means of good deeds. Not by means of the works of the law. So, once again, he, he writes here, You who want to be under the law. Now, when someone goes under the law, what does it do? It manifests their sin. In other words, one of the reasons why the law was given was to show us our sinfulness, so to teach us that if it was dependent upon us being good enough, then we would never enter into the kingdom of God. Now, not too long ago, I was listening to a, a teacher in Israel, a rabbi, and he was talking about the schut, the, the merit to enter into the kingdom of God. And what he said was this, that God has a, a big balance. And what he does is this. He looks at our, our good deeds and he weighs them against our sin. And in this balance, if we have more good deeds than we do sins, we'll merit the entrance into the kingdom of God and that's why he was saying it was so important to engage in good deeds. Well, I agree with some of that. I agree it's important to engage in good deeds. That is to obey the word of God. But it is not through the observance of good deeds. Anywhere in the scripture do we see that one is justified. 
Paul has been speaking and speaking and speaking in this book of Galatians that no flesh will be justified by the observance of of the commandments doing good deeds nor do we nowhere in the scripture we see this this idea of a balance and if we have more then everything would be okay so what does he say well let's move on to the next verse verse 22 he writes and i love that because paul throughout this entire section that we're going to study today you're going to see that everything he's teaching is based upon the torah itself everything is going to be based upon what one can learn from the first five books of the bible and there we find the plan of salvation there we find the revelation of the work of messiah so what does he say verse 22 for it's written that abraham had two sons one son from the slave woman and the other from the free woman now it's obvious here that he's talking about the two women hagar and sarah but it's important that we find that that sarah's never mentioned by name she's referred to and we'll see this in a moment in a different way so these two women each of them had a son and we read in verse verse 22 one son was born according to the flesh that is according to man man's way man's thoughts we remember that we see that there was a a a problem sarah could not give birth so even though god promised her she was thinking in the flesh and abraham and went along with it and she says take my maidservant this woman in slavery and and through her you'll have a son and this will be what god was referring to see she wanted to keep god's promise according to the flesh it can't be done and later on we see that there was also another child but notice there's a total change in language in the first part it says that was born according to the flesh but in that second son it says that he came about not according to but by means of the promise and that word by means of or through is very important it tells us that there is a power there is an anointing on the promises of god if we utilize them and how do we do that simply to believe move on to verse 24 these things are are allegorical for these are two covenants one from the mountain of sinai which gives birth to slavery which is hagar now what's important here well he puts into the equation the first time slavery it was alluded by the name hagar but what's important here he ties slavery to what covenant he says there's two and the first one he talks about is the covenant of mount sinai the law now in a few minutes he's going to unite that symbolically with jerusalem of today in fact let's just read that verse so we're all together move on to verse 25 he says but hagar is mount sinai which is in arabia that is saudi arabia of today and we read on she parallels the jerusalem of our day now why is that important well what's the connection between jerusalem and the law of moses well very simple when i hear jerusalem you know what comes into my mind first the command excuse me the temple now when i think about the temple as an individual you know many people might say well that holy of holies but the problem is for a jewish individual or even for a gentile that that holy of holies had no personal relevance for us it told us that god was there that it was his home his presence and all of that and that's important but the place when the scripture says that you shall go up to jerusalem it also tells us don't go up there empty-handed what is it referring to that's right a sacrifice 
And where would we make those sacrifices? On the altar. So biblically speaking, when we talk about Jerusalem for a human being, the place that is key, the most important one, is the altar. Now, what the scripture says is you need to go up to Jerusalem one time in your life, make a sacrifice, and that takes care of everything, correct? No, it does not. In fact, it says you have to go up three times a year. And when we look elsewhere in the scripture, it all talks, also talks about other sacrifices that one has to make because primarily of sin. So when we look at the book, for example, the book of Leviticus, when it speaks about sacrifices at the first part, what is always emphasized? The sin sacrifice. In fact, every day there's what's called the Korban Hatamid, the daily sacrifice. But it doesn't say really the daily sacrifice. That word tamid means always. And what does it refer to? Well, the rabbis get this right. It gets it right because it says over and over continuously, we need to go and make a sacrifice. Why? Well, this daily sacrifice speaks to the fact that we are in bondage to sin. So this is what Paul's doing. He was trained as a rabbi. He says, you understand this. You understand how the Torah relates to Jerusalem. That was the point of it, that it was going to talk about where God would cause his name to dwell. He would build a house. But the key part of that temple for humanity is that that altar where sacrifices had to be made continuously because of that continuous problem of sin, this slavery to the sin. So that's what he says. It's in Arabia. It symbolizes the Jerusalem of of our day. He says Jerusalem literally of now, which uh, she serves with her children, meaning Hagar and her children, all those that came from her were also in slavery. And if you utilize the Torah, that is the commandments, that is the offerings as a way of of salvation, what's going to happen? You'll never stop being a slave, a slave to sin. But move on to verse 26. Verse 26 says, but the Jerusalem up above. Now, this is important because we know when Paul, excuse me, when Moses, when he received the revelation You can look sometime at the book of Hebrews, chapter 8 and verse 5 and 6, and it speaks about how Moses received the the pattern of how to build the, the tabernacle, which would become later on the temple. And he received that from what he saw, the pattern that he saw in the heavens. So there was a similarity. What was up above in the heavens was also down below except for one thing. And the Hasidim teach this, and they're absolutely right. There was one small difference. There was no altar in the heavens, no Mizbeh Nechoshet. Now, that's the bronze altar, which was for sacrifices. There was the Mizbeh Hazahav, which is the golden altar, which was for incense. That was also, we read in the scripture, that that was in the heavens as well. But the altar for sacrifices weren't in the heavens. Why? Because one does not enter into the heavens based upon his sacrifice. Quite the contrary. We're going to see that it's made through means of God's provision of his son, Messiah Yeshua, and what he did, and it's very specific, he did not lay down his life on the altar in Jerusalem. In fact, it was says that it's outside the city, meaning that he supplied redemption. But we ought not see that as simply as an, an altar sacrifice, but something that triumphs that, the giving of the only begotten Son of God. So look, if you would, to verse 26. He says, but the Jerusalem up above is free. That is, it brings about, and this word freedom probably parallels a Hebrew word, chirut. Now, let's go back for a moment and see the paradigm. We know that Paul is saying here that these things symbolize, they're an illustration, an allegory of of what we read in the Torah. 
Now, what do we read there? Well, we read that, that God wanted to bring his children out of Egypt. What were they in Egypt? Slaves. They were in slavery. So God gave Moses the Torah. He took it to Egypt and said, here, do commandments, good deeds, and when you do enough, I'll bring you out of Egypt. Is that what happened? Absolutely not. We see that it was through the blood of the Lamb, a Passover sacrifice, that God, by his grace, brought the children out of slavery, and it uses the word chirut, freedom. Now, why is that important? Because this word chirut does not mean I get to do what I want. Chirut is being set free for God, to serve him, to walk with him, to, to bring glory to him. So it says in this passage of scripture, look again at verse 26, but the Jerusalem up above is free, which is our mother. Now, why does it use the term mother? Obviously, we've been talking, there's been a couple references to Hagar, the, the mother of Yishmael, who symbolizes this, this slavery, which parallels Jerusalem of our day, that is, of the temple. But Sarah and the child that is produced through her according to the promise says, well, this woman, and we don't have her name. All we have is she is our mother. And why would Paul write that? Well, remember, he comes from a Jewish background. He had rabbinical training. And this word M or mother in, in the biblical language has to do with that which gives life. So what he wants to say is this, when you utilize the commandments for salvation, now stop for a moment, there's people who want to say, and we're coming to a verse which they want to use and say, here, get rid of the Torah. It has no use whatsoever. That's not what Paul's saying. What he's saying is, if the issue is justification, if the issue is being made righteous, that is being in a state of being acceptable to God, then the Torah has no purpose. All it does is show us our need for redemption. It shows us our sin. But if we're not talking about justification, the Torah, Paul says, is good, it's wise, and it reveals great information to us. So the Torah has a purpose. That purpose is simply not salvation. And that's why we see something. When the children of Israel came out of, of Egypt, they were set free not by means of the Torah, not by good deeds, but rather by the blood of that Passover lamb. And we see something. God wanted to bring them immediately into the promised land. But because of a lack of faith, they were called to spend 40 years in that wilderness. And when God eventually, because of that lack of faith, that generation died out, when we don't believe, we die, both spiritually and physically. So he brings this new generation into the land. And what's the land called? Well, one of the ways that God refers to it is the land of promise. And that's so important, the land of promise. A promise and you enter into that land according to the promise of God and that's why he unites here the land is synonymous with the kingdom that is it's parallel to that we entered into the kingdom according to the promise and here's the key in order to remind them of this when they cross over the Jordan River and entered the first time into the promised land what did he have them do circumcise themselves now why was that well, here's the problem. Many people connect circumcision with the law of Moses. You ought not. Because circumcision came into being, that commandment was given to who? Abraham. And what was the purpose of it? To teach the death of the flesh. So circumcision, the death of the flesh, is the outcome of faith, not the outcome of good deeds, the, the keeping of the law. So once again, what do we see here? Well, it's very important. The Jerusalem of our day, the Jerusalem of our day is tied to the Torah. But the Jerusalem up above is tied to freedom or liberty and life. That's why the mother is mentioned here. Move on to verse 27. 
Now, Paul's going to give a citation now from the book of Isaiah on that same issue, but he does it differently. Notice what he says. He quotes Isaiah 54 and he says, Rejoice, O barren woman who did not give birth. Who's he talking about? Sarah. He says, Shout and cry out the one who did not labor, that is, never suffered in labor. Why? For more will be the children of the desolate woman, that's Sarah, rather than the one having a husband. But here's the key. Now, this is is written in the New Covenant in Greek, but in in order to understand the message here, we have to go back to the original text. Because that term husband can also refer to the Hebrew word baal. And it can mean also a master or a lord. It can refer to slavery. So it's a play on words. More than the woman that was in slavery. But she had what? She had a man. She had Abraham. But in the end, through the physical, she had what? None of her children are going to enter into the kingdom simply because of that birth. Why do I say that? Well, drop down to verse 28, he says, And you, brethren, are according to Isaac, that is, children of the promise. God promised Abraham and Sarah. He didn't promise Abraham and Hagar. That was according to, he says, the flesh. Look at verse 29. And just as now, according the one born according to the flesh, what does he do? He persecutes the one that was born according to what? Notice what it says. It says, according to the Spirit. Now, the Spirit is important because it is tied, that is, He is tied to redemption. We see many places in the Scripture, one of the outcomes of redemption is the giving of the Spirit. We talked about that. Here's a citation, Isaiah 59, verse 20. It ties the Redeemer with the sealing of the Spirit. But here's the key that we see. What Paul wants us to realize is this. Those who are in the flesh, they're going to persecute those who are in the spirit. And he gives an example. Move on to the next verse, verse verse 20 or verse 30. He says, but I say to you, let's go back to verse 29. He says, those who are born in the spirit, they persecute those Those who are born in the flesh, they persecute those according to the Spirit even today. Now, verse 30. What does the scripture say? It says, cast out the the slave woman and her children because they will not, here's the key, they will not inherit. Now, they won't inherit what? Anything. But according to the original context, it's talking about the land. Now, why is that important? Well, in the original context from the book of Genesis, they're not going to inherit the land. They're cast out of the promised land. And that is, once Paul says throughout all of this, it's allegorical. It's to teach us there is an allegory between entrance into the promised land and entrance into the kingdom of God. So those who are born according to the flesh, they won't. You have to be born, and he makes a switch here. Twice, when he talks about Abraham's covenant, he calls it a covenant of promise. He says it twice. But now, when he gets to the climax of his teaching, he takes out the word promise, and he substitutes the word spirit. Why? Ultimately, that promise is is made manifested. It's sealed. It comes into being through the spirit. And the Spirit is not given, of course, we're speaking about the Holy Spirit. He is not given by works of the law. He's given by faith in the grace of God. He is the one that shows us this new life, not death, which is synonymous with the law. The law teaches that we are sinful. Sin is synonymous with death. But faith brings about life, abundant life. So what does he say? Look again, verse verse 29 at the end. He says, cast out the slave woman and her children, for he will not inherit with the son of the the free woman. 
he says, Therefore, brethren, we are not of the children of the slave woman, but rather we are children of the free. And that word free has also to do with liberty. And that's what Paul is going to be speaking about next week. He's going to talk about the liberty that we have to do what? To serve God, to bring honor to him, to walk with him, and to manifest his name. What does it mean to manifest his name? It means to manifest his character. And that's why he talks about here that we belong to Jerusalem up above. That that spiritual kingdom that manifests the character of God. The heavens declare what? The glory of God. Now, that's what we're supposed to do. So we are these children of promise. And what does he do? These children of the Spirit, so that we might do exactly what God reveals all the way back in the very first part of the Torah. I want to close with this. When God created the heavens and the earth, he saw that they were tohu vevo, that is empty, formless, without order. And the next thing we read is this. We read about the Spirit of God hovering over the waters. And we see by means of that Spirit, things were brought into order. And that Spirit, Holy Spirit, wants to bring your life into the order of God. He wants to fulfill God's purposes for you being born into this world. And the only way that that can happen is if you receive the promise of God. That is, if you receive the Spirit of God that will lead you and guide you not to walk in the slavery of sin, but to walk in the freedom of the Spirit that will cause us to fulfill the righteousness of the law. That's what Paul says in Romans chapter 8 and verse 4. So God is speaking here about this covenant of Abraham that brings about great change. How can we summarize it? One phrase. It causes us to bring about kingdom change in our life, that we can manifest that heavenly character that reveals the glory of God. Well, I'm out of time. Until next week, may God continue to bless you.